Father, I thank you so much for every woman that you've brought into this auditorium, every young girl, every teenager. I thank you for the women who are watching through the live stream and who will be watching later. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to share all the things that you've been teaching me from 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels but do not have love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. But now, faith, hope, love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. This is part two of the greatest love. And the last time we gathered together, we covered the first uh, four verses, but not quite through the fourth verse. We stopped short of finishing the fourth verse. But let me just review a little bit by, by reading the first part again. If I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And we talked about how we can speak eloquently. We can have the gift of oratory. We can just speak melodious things. But if we don't have have love it's just a bunch of noise and then verse 2 says and if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love I am nothing so I'm noise if I don't have love and then I'm nothing if I don't have love even if I have all the knowledge and I can forth tell God's word but if I don't have love I'm nothing and then verse 3 and if I give all my possessions to feed the poor and if I surrender my body Body to be burned, but do not have love. It profits me nothing. So I'm noise. I am nothing, and then I gain nothing. That's what the scripture tells us. We can have all the acts of service, do so many things for so many people, even to the point of death. But if I don't have love, I gain nothing. And then verse four: Love is patient. We learn that it's not sentimental, that it's long-suffering, that it has a long fuse. Love is patient. Love is kind. And kindness is a chosen kindness. It's not just random. We choose to be kind. And is not jealous. And we talked about jealousy, how it is so destructive and it ruins people. And we acknowledge that it will always be an issue for us in this life. Because in this life, we will probably never be free from the temptation to be jealous. However, we don't have to give in to the temptation. And to help us see the destructive nature of jealousy, God not only tells us that love is not jealous, but he also gives us many examples in Scripture of its ruining nature. I wanted to cover a few of these last time, but I was running out of time. But, I, I, but let me just uh, tell you a few things. Think about the first woman, Eve, who in essence, was jealous of God. Remember how the serpent appealed to her? He told her, you're not going to die. In fact, your eyes are going to be open. And then the words, you will be like God, creating in her, stirring up in her a sense of jealousy. Don't you want to be like God? And in fact, that was 
his problem. He was an angel, but he was jealous of God. He was prideful. He desired to be God, not to be God's servant. He wanted to be God. He was a beautiful angel, but he wasn't satisfied with that. He was not content with that. He wanted what God had and wanted to be who God is. He was jealous. And that's exactly how he tempted Adam and Eve. And then after they sinned, you just turn the pages of Scripture, and then you see the destructive, ruining nature of jealousy. Their first child, Cain, he killed his brother Abel. Why? Because he was jealous of him. He murdered his brother because of jealousy. Then later, Jacob, in the Scriptures, was jealous of Esau's birthright, and he deceived him and then had to run for his life away from him. Then later, we see Joseph's brothers who were so jealous of him. You know what they did. They sold him into slavery. But not only did they sell him into slavery, but they let their father grieve and think that he was dead for years without coming clean. All of that was because of jealousy. And King Saul was so jealous of David that he became his enemy. And that's just a few little pictures just a little bit of a smattering from the early part of the Old Testament. But there are so many other examples in Scripture. So much to learn. So much to teach your children and grandchildren about the destructive nature of jealousy. And of course, there's just real-life examples we can teach and instruct from. I'm talking about real life for us today. That was real life in the Bible, but real life even that we see in the day and age in which we live. And then we concluded last time with love does not brag. And bragging is just means you're showing off. We said the King James uses the term vaunt. Love does not vaunt itself. It doesn't strut its stuff. It doesn't parade itself. And that, of course, brings us to the last part of verse 4 to today that we didn't delve into last time because the, the verse 4 um, is read like this. Love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Arrogance, of course, really does fall on the heels of bragging. Love is not arrogant. It's not puffed up. And, of course, being arrogant means that you like to exaggerate or you like to um, talk about your own worth or your own importance. A person who is, who is arrogant is unpleasantly proud and behaves as if he or she is more important than or knows more than other people. Arrogance has a condes- condescending nature to it. It's pompous. Arrogance is showing off a superiority. And we're all aware of people like this. We all know people that we would immediately say, yeah, he's arrogant, she's arrogant. But it might even be us. We might be the ones who are arrogant. Because when you're arrogant, you think you are better than other people. You think others are losers. And you describe them that way. If they do not meet up to your standards of what you think they ought to be. And this is a good reminder for us, just even talking about this, is that we are not to puff up our children. We are not to flatter our children and make them arrogant. Praise? Of course, yes, we are to praise them. Just like Hebrews tells us, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. We are to encourage one another. The Scripture is filled with commands for us to encourage one another and to praise one another as much as we can. And when we see good, we should praise it. We should commend it. We should say something about it because that does encourage the one that we're praising in the right way to excel still more. Just like Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, he told them all of the good things they were doing and encouraged them and praised them for it. And then he added, now I want you to excel still more. And that motivates us to excel more. So we should be doing that. And we should be praising our children for their hard work, for a job well done, for their obedience, for their kindness that they show to their siblings or to other people. We should teach them their worth before God as Psalm 139 teaches us. But with that, in teaching them their worth before God, we also have to be teaching them their sinfulness before God and how God in his kindness sent Jesus to redeem them because he set his love on them. He sets his love to redeem. That's what he wants to do. But puffing them up, 
That's an entirely different story. And we are to be humble. The best way that we can not puff up our children is not to be puffed up ourselves. We're not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. And we need to help our children not to think more highly of themselves than they ought to think. Do you know the story that Jesus told in Luke chapter 18 about the two men who were in the temple praying? In verse 9, the scripture says this, And he also told this parable to some people, and listen to this, who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. He also told this parable to some of the people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Talk about prideful, being arrogant, condescending, trusted in themselves that they were righteous. And then the scripture continues, and viewed others with contempt, because that's usually the, what happens. If we are trusting in ourselves that we're righteous and that we're so great, then the tendency is to view others with contempt. Verse 10, two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector, this loser over here. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. That's what, that was what he was standing on, his own righteousness, thinking more highly of himself than he ought and looking on someone else with contempt. Verse 13, but the tax collector standing some distance away was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast saying, God be merciful to me, the sinner. I mean, he's beating his breast, an act of humility, understanding how unworthy he is. And Jesus said in verse 14, I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. And then I love how, when you continue reading this passage, I love how this motivated the people who were listening. Because remember, in, the, the, in verse 9, the Scripture tells us that he's telling this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. So he tells the parable, and then the reaction of the people in verse 15, and they were bringing even their babies to him so that he would touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they began rebuking them. But Jesus called for them, saying, Permit the children to come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. I mean, children were looked down on in those days. <laughs> they were unimportant. You know, people who were adults looked at them as if they were nothing. And, of course, this is what's going on. The, the people now are motivated because of what Jesus has just shared to bring their children to the Lord. Jesus is emphasizing here the humility of these children. That's what he's emphasizing when he says, Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter at all. You think about the characteristics of a child. They're very trusting. They're very humble. Little children, they just depend on you for everything. And that's what Jesus is emphasizing here. And then in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. Do you see what's going on here? Do you see who the giver is? He says, through the grace given to me, I mean, we are what we are only because of God's grace. We have what we have only because it's a gift of God. We know what we know only because it's a gift of God. Whatever our station in life, whatever our possessions that we own, whatever our health is like, all those things are gifts to us from God. All of the things that God grants to us is a gift from God to an unworthy sinner because we are all tax gatherers. We are all tax gatherers collectors. We are all unworthy. We are all losers before the Lord. We can't point to someone else and say, well, that guy's a loser. I'm a loser. That's who we are before the Lord. And so we ought not to think more highly of ourselves 
We, we, we should not be putting ourselves on a platform, on a pedestal, and think we're greater than God says we are. Because, see, here's the thing. Arrogance has this humongous head, a head out to here. I mean, it just would explode. You pop it, and it would explode. It's so big. But love has a big heart, and love gives, and love has compassion on those people that the world calls losers, or maybe that we call losers. The next verse says, love does not act unbecomingly. I love that. I love that. I just love that. Does not act unbecomingly. And it means love is not rude. It means love has good manners. And of course, we all know what rude is. It's offensively impolite. You're offensive. You're impolite. You're ill-mannered. You're very abrupt. You're very rough. And, of course, the King James Version says it like this. Love does not behave itself unseemly. Now, let's talk about this for just a moment. Think about yourself. And I'll think about myself as I have been. Do I act unbecomingly? I mean, just in the normal everydayness of life. Not here when we're, like, gathered and we're smiling at each other and we're, you know, polite and we're kind. We're not going to come in here and be big, rude women. And we're not going to do that. But just in the everydayness of life, you know, just everyday life. Are you rude towards your husband? Do you act unbecomingly toward him? Are you rude to your children? Do you act unbecomingly towards them? Are you rude when your friends aren't around or when people aren't watching you? When you're not on display? I mean, think about it. Consider it. Think about this. Just think about yourself for a moment. What's your normal, your default demeanor? Just what you default to. Is it to be rude? I mean, let's talk about an example here for a second. Let's say your husband comments very rudely to you about something. I don't know, maybe what you're wearing, maybe the food, maybe I, I, just whatever. He's very rude to you. What do you do? Do you give it right back? Are you rude in return? Do you speak rudely when you answer? How about dealing with your children's sins? Do you call them names? Do you sin when your children sin? Do you sin when you're dealing with your children's sin? I mean, just think about that for a second. Because it's easy to say we don't, but it's also easy to sin when we're dealing with their sin. Calling them names, exasperating them, expecting way too much of them, expecting them to get something right away when it took us so many times to get it, but we expect perfection from them. Do we yell uncontrollably at them because, you know, a desire of the flesh is we like to, like, just let it out. That's just a desire of the flesh. Galatians says, if we walk by the Spirit, we will not carry out the desires of the flesh. So you have to decide, am I walking with God? Am I walking with the Spirit so I won't carry out what is the natural desire of my flesh? Do you berate or threaten them? I mean, seriously, think about it. When you are upset about a child's behavior, that is the very best time to look in the mirror at yourself. It just is. It really is. I mean, that's one of the things I think God's um, probably taught me the most when I was raising my own children was when I would see things in their behavior that really bothered me. And I would think, what's going on here? And then I would think about my own behavior because our children are little mirrors they imitate us you criticize people what are they going to do they're going to criticize people but you'll get on them about it you put others down they'll put others down but you'll get on them about it you act snobby and condescending towards others They'll lack snobby and condescending toward others, but you'll get on them about it. You think you're better than other people? They'll think they're better than other people, but you'll get on them about it. And the list goes on and on and on and on. 
And since we're talking here a little bit about how we relate to our children, how do you talk about your children to other people? Are you unseemly in the way you talk about them to your friends? For example, do you complain about them to other people? About how stressful it is raising them? And how hard it is because this one's so stubborn and this one is so disobedient. And this one lies all the time. And this one exaggerates. And this one just has this annoying habit that I can't stand. Now, I'm not talking about talking to them about these things and helping them and discipling them. I'm talking about talking about them freely to other people. Do you grumble about your family and about the messes they make? And I'm talking about grumbling about it. Do you put more importance on your house than you do on what's taking place in your house? And, what's, and more importance on the things in your house than the children who are in your house? Do you embarrass your children by telling everyone about their mishaps and their silliness? I mean, we've all done this. I've been guilty of this with my children when they were younger. Do you make fun of your children, your husband, your in-laws, your parents? This is all unbecoming behavior. It's all unseemly. All of it is rude. And love is not rude. Love does not act unbecomingly. So the real question is, do I love? The real question is not even, do I love this person? The real question is, do I love God? And I want to encourage you here, be loyal to your family. Be loyal to your husband and children. You know how the proverb says that the heart of her husband safely trusts in her? He doesn't have to worry that she's out telling everyone his aggravating habits. He doesn't have to worry that She's revealing stuff that she should not be revealing about her husband when she gathers with her girlfriends. Well, you know, yeah, he does that and he does this. Be loyal to your children and your grandchildren. Be loyal to your in-laws and your parents. And of course, as I'm talking about this, I'm not talking about good-natured and loving jokes. That's fine. That's good. You know, you love someone and you joke around about stuff. That's all great. But there is a difference between good-natured and loving joking around and just playing, making fun of someone. I mean, all of us, we've all, I'm sure, we're all guilty of this because we love to talk about our families. And, but if we're not walking with the Lord, if we're not filled with the Spirit, we'll talk about them negatively and in ways we shouldn't talk about them. Ephesians 4, verse 29 says this, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. So think about that for a second. With my speech, is it corrupting talk coming out of my mouth? Is it? Now, we're not talking about, you know, slang and cuss words but just something that corrupts another person, that, that, that defiles them, that makes them feel like dirt. <laughs> I mean, God said this. I'm not saying it. He says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up. So am I building up with the things I say? Even as I'm correcting, even as I'm dealing with a characteristic or problem in my child's life or with a sister in Christ's life or someone, am I building them up even as I am correcting? And does it fit the occasion? Does my talking give grace to those who hear? And our children and grandchildren are listening, even if I am not talking to them. They hear what I say to and about other people. And does what I say give grace? Verse 30, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. I mean, just let those words sink in. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So the question is, is, 
Am I grieving the Holy Spirit by the way I talk to and about others? Am I? And what does it mean to grieve him? Of course, we know what the word grieve means. It means to cause great distress, sadness, causing a wound, causing pain. So, and Paul, in that verse, in those, just, in those few words, he gives the reason why we are not to grieve the Holy Spirit because he says, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit sealed us for the day of redemption. When you came to know the Lord God, the Holy Spirit sealed you. It's like a down payment. You belong to the Lord, and he's coming back for you. He's coming for you. And then the scripture continues, in him we also have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things in accordance with the plan of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. That's, that's what we are to be, the praise of his glory. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. There it is again. Who is the first installment, the down payment of our inheritance. It's coming in regard to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. There it is again, to the praise of his glory. So why would we want to grieve the Holy Spirit by being rude? by acting unbecomingly, by being unseemly? I mean, why? Ephesians 4, 31 says this, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. And then if that wasn't enough, he says, along with all malice. Now think about those words for a second. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, and malice. Think, you just got to think about it. That's a huge list. And he lists all those things separately. And this is a negative command in the sense that we are not to live this way. This, this way is unbecoming for a believer. But is your life or my life filled with bitterness? I mean, bitterness, we know what that is too. It's resentment. The Cambridge Dictionary describes it like this. Someone who is bitter is angry and unhappy because they cannot forget bad things that happened to them in the past. Cannot forget. That's what the Cambridge Dictionary says. And the, 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 that dictionary says cannot. And it might be true that we can't forget bad things from our past. We can choose not to remember it. We can move from it and away from it. We can choose, too, how we remember it. I mean, yeah, we have to deal with it honestly before the Lord. We can't and we should not suppress it, just stuff it. No, we need to deal with it biblically. That's what God would have us do, deal with it before him. I mean, for example, let's say you're bitter at your parents because they were abusive when you were growing up. They were harsh. They were unloving. Just fill in the blank. And the, and the reason I'm using this as, as an example is because I've talked to so many people over 30 years of ministry, and this is a major problem. And I mean, they really were. I'm not talking here about someone who's mad at their parents because their parents were not perfect and didn't give them everything they wanted, and they are upset about stupid things. I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. I'm talking about an upbringing that really was bad. And I don't necessarily even mean it was necessarily physically abusive, but just really the, ch the children were neglected in, in, in so many ways or, or were unloved, and it was harsh. Well, once you come to know Christ and you realize his love for you and you realize what he has saved you from, that even in that harsh, terrible environment, he set his love on you and he saved you, then God begins to give you a different perspective. You're able to honestly say, my upbringing was awful, but God in his kindness saved me, and he has changed me, and through his Holy Spirit in me, I can be different. I can move on, and I can learn all that God wants to teach me through it, and I can even start praying for my parents. And then after you've dealt with it, even in a baby step kind of way, Whenever the harshness comes to mind, 
You can submit the way you think about it to the Holy Spirit. You let God, through his Holy Spirit, renew your mind. Replace it with the kindness of the Lord and all that he wants to do in your life in spite of it. Because if you don't, bitterness leads to wrath and anger and clamor and slander and malice. And then not only that, you will develop the despised parenting habits that you hated in your upbringing. You've got to deal with these things before the Lord. And some people over the years, they've, they've needed you know, more help than I can give them. But bitterness doesn't ruin the ones toward whom we feel bitterness. It ruins us. Wrath is extreme anger. It's vengeful anger. It's wanting to get someone back. It wants to punish someone for an offense. It's a serious thing. And sometimes we are so wrathful towards someone that hurt us that we want to punish them. Maybe give them the silent treatment. In so many ways, we just look for ways to hurt them. Even through, in, through and in social media, looking for ways to hurt people and punish them. Then wrath and anger, the scripture says, leads to clamor. Clamor is loud and confusing noise. It's boisterous and it's insistent shouting. And isn't our society filled with these kinds of women? Seriously? You and I need to guard our hearts and ask God to cleanse us from this, that we don't become the boisterous woman like Proverbs 7 describes, Proverbs 5, Proverbs 7. She's boisterous. She's loud. She's obnoxious. It's unbecoming to be this way. And this uncontrolled anger, the natural result, is clamor. And then clamor, the natural result, is slander. And we know what slander is. It's false accusations that damage, damages someone's reputation. Damaging statements about someone. It's, you know, what the scripture, too, calls a malicious gossip. That's the intent to hurt someone. And, of course, I've known over the years plenty of teenage girls and adult children who by their words slander their own parents <laughs> make false accusations against their parents falsely accusing them and if that's true of you or if it has been true of you and you've never confessed that and repented of it to the lord get on your knees and do that because that is sin and then slander leads to malice. Malice is the intention or desire to do evil, not just to hurt someone, but to do evil. The intention to cause pain and suffering on someone. It's a hostile thing. And of course, with all of this, we have to consider ourselves. And in this verse, Paul, you know, when he writes this, he says, you know, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. And it's like, oh, all these awful things. And then the very next, next verse says, I mean, that's the negative. Put this stuff away. And here's the positive. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ also forgave you. There it is again. And don't you just love that? It's almost like the tension just leaves. Because God doesn't just leave us here with all these negative commands. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. Put this stuff away. Get rid of this. Get rid of this. Get rid of this. You'll see the same pattern in Colossians chapter 3. You'll see it in Ephesians. You'll see it all throughout the Bible where, where God gives you the negative commands of what you're not to be, not to do. But then he turns right around and he says, here's what you replace it with. Here's what you replace it with. Be kind to one another. Be tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. This is becoming to a believer. This is, this is what we ought to be doing. And of course, there it is again. Be kind. Remember, love is patient. Love is kind. Be tender-hearted. And that's a part of being kind is you're tender-hearted. You have compassion. You have a soft, sympathetic, empathetic heart. You have a gentle nature towards people rather than a harsh, abusive, I'm going to tell them and give them what for. I mean, you know, in 1 Peter chapter 3, 
the scripture tells us that we as women are to have a gentle and quiet spirit. It's precious in the sight of God. That's what 1 Peter 3 tells us. He points to Sarah. He points to the holy women of old when he's talking to women about how they should live with a mean husband, a, a, a mean guy. But that's what we are to have. We're to have a gentle and a quiet spirit that puts her hope in God. That's the foundation of it. It's not just, oh, yeah, I'm just, I just have this quiet nature. No, I can, be, I can have a quietness, a quiet heart, a quiet nature about me because my trust and my hope is in the Lord, not in myself, not in all my good deeds or whatever I might think highly of, more highly of myself than I ought. No, my trust is in the Lord. And that's why Sarah could have that kind of heart because rather than trusting in Abraham who, was, who put her in the harem twice, her hope was in the Lord, not in Abraham. And then he says, forgiving one another. Why? Because God forgave you. He gives that, just like earlier when he says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. You are sealed by him. You know, you have an inheritance with him. Don't grieve him. Here's why. And here he's saying, forgive one another. Why? Because God forgave you. God forgave me. And how is it that I can be so prideful sometimes as to try to punish people that I perceive has wronged me? Have I ever been wronged the way Jesus Christ was wronged? Have I ever been wronged that way? Have I ever been scourged with a whip? Have I ever had a crown of thorns buried on my head, the blood running down? Have I ever had a spear in my side? Have I ever had people mocking me as I hang naked? Have I ever had that? Have I ever been beaten and bruised and spat upon? Have I ever been wrong that way, in the way that Christ was wronged? And he's the innocent one, never did anything wrong, enduring all of that for you and for me so that we can be redeemed because he set his love on us, his love on us. And this is why we can be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving each other because God has forgiven us. And see, here's the thing, when we walk with Christ, Christ, when we're close to him, we cannot wait to show love to someone. We cannot wait to be kind. I just want an opportunity to show kindness to that person. We can't wait to show tender mercy, to be tenderhearted. We can't wait to forgive them. We can't wait for the relationship to be restored. We're not folding our arms and saying, nope, 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 nope. No, we can't wait to be reconciled. It's like the father of the prodigal son. Remember him? He was looking for his son to return. He could not wait to forgive him. He wasn't thinking, oh, well, when my son, if my son ever comes back, I'm going to give him the what for, and I'm going to say I told you so, and I'm going to berate him, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. No. <laughs> He couldn't wait to forgive him. He couldn't wait to welcome him back into his arms, back into the fold. But if we're quick to hold on to bitterness, we're just telling on ourselves. We're just telling on ourselves that we really don't love Christ and we've never really understood our forgiveness in Christ. Because we think more highly of ourselves than we ought and so we behave unbecomingly towards other people. 1 Corinthians 13, the next part says, Love does not seek its own. Does not insist on its own way, one translation says. One says, love is not selfish. By nature, however, that's exactly who and what we are. Isaiah 53, verse 6 says, We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. You hear that? All of us, each one of us, every single one of us has turned to our own way. And yet, again, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. All of our iniquities he's laid on Christ. Because all of us, like sheep, have, gone, have we strayed away. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 24, the scripture tells us, 
Let no one seek his own good but that of his neighbor. And, of course, he's writing this to the Corinthians. Remember how I told you there's a bunch of spiritual babies, a bunch of prideful people in the church. They're fighting about everything under the sun. They're bringing lawsuits against each other. They're fighting over spiritual gifts. They're fighting over what teachers they follow. They're even bragging and boasting about the sexual immorality. There's so much even perversion in the church. But so Paul is telling them, don't seek your own good but that of your neighbor. James 3, verses 13 to 18 says this, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy, there it is again, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, I mean, love does not seek its own, and selfish ambition in your heart, and then he says, do not be arrogant, love is not arrogant, and so lie against the truth, and later we're going to talk about love rejoices in the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but it's earthly, natural, demonic. I mean, that's what he's saying about this kind of stuff. Is that what you want to be unbecoming in those ways where, that, where you're arrogant, where you're jealous, where you're a liar, where you have bitter jealousy, where you have selfish ambition? God says that that stuff is earthly and even demonic. And he, sa- he continues, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing but the wisdom from above is first pure there it is you know all this negative and then he goes to what wisdom from above his wisdom is is pure then it's peaceable it's gentle it's reasonable it's full of mercy and good fruits it's unwavering it is without hypocrisy and the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace that is becoming That's someone who's not seeking their own. And so, again, it begs the question, do you seek your own? Does it always have to be your way? Do you always have to be in control? Do I always have to be in control? Does everything have to be my way? And do you see why I have said a lot last time, and I say it, I'll say it again this time, we need God and his supernatural power to live this way. We need him to live it through us, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Because on our own, we're selfish people. We are to seek the good of others. Proverbs 11, verse 25 says, The generous man will be prosperous, and he who waters will himself be watered. Romans 15, verses 1 to 7. Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Because that's what we always want to do. We want to just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to his edification. I mean, who wants to do that? I mean, don't we just want to please, I want to just please myself. Why should I worry about his good and his edification? And then the scripture in Romans continues, For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. We're going to learn later, too, that about hope in this series. But we might have hope. Now may the God who gives perseverance, there it is again, he's the one who gives it to us. It's not something I conjure up on my own. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another in Christ Jesus, according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, he says, accept one another just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. There it is again. Accept one another. Why? Because Christ accepted you to the glory of God. Mark chapter 12, verse 31. One of the, uh, actually, I'm going to start with verse 28. One of the scribes came and heard them arguing and recognizing that he, talking about Jesus, had answered them well, he asked Jesus, what commandment is the foremost of all? And Jesus answered, the foremost is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And there it is. We love ourselves. We want our own good. We like to seek our own edification, but we're to do that for someone else. 
Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Because here's the thing, y'all. If we love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind, and with all our strength, the natural thing is, is we're going to love other people. We just are. We're going to learn what God's love is like. We're going to learn the love of the Bible. We're going to learn God's love and not love is love and all the phrases that we hear out there because the world has just abused love. The world has all the wrong definitions of love. Now think about this in relation to your own home. Your home is not just about you. Love does not seek its own, okay? Love is not selfish. doesn't always have to be my way. It's not just about mom even. Don't mess that up. Don't come in here with that mess. I mean, do your children feel unwelcome in mom's house? Like the house and its furnishings are more important than they are? Now, of course, you set reasonable standards as you teach the value of property and personal responsibility, but your children should not get the fury of mom's wrath and anger if they mess up or if they're not perfect. <laughs> they're children. It's our job to train them, but not just train them. Remember we talked about last time, you can give all the right instructions, but if you don't have love, you're just noise. It's our job to train them in love. You speak the truth in love. And so to reiterate or say it a little bit differently, you're the manager and you have to set the standards and expectations in taking care of your home and helping your children understand all those things. But it's not just about you. Love does not seek its own. And then the next on the list is love is not provoked. And this means it's not irritable. The King James Version says, love is not easily provoked. Are you? Are you easily provoked? Does it just take nothing to set you off? I mean, the reality is this. There is a lot to be provoked about. There really is a lot to be irritable about. But again, I asked you earlier about uh, your default demeanor. Is it your default demeanor just to be irritable? Do you wake up in the morning and you're just irritable? And they said, one of the things you just have to say, Lord, help me not to be irritable. I realize my default is I'm an irritable person. I need your help so that I'm not irritable. Do your children see you as easily irritated? Better not bother mom. Better not go in there. She can get awful mean. She's cranky. Oh, mom's on the warpath today. Don't get near mom. Avoid mom. Is that how your children feel about you? Where it's more that way than it is, oh, mom's in a good mood. Hooray, we better take advantage of it. Easily provoked. Love is not provoked. Provoked comes from the word provocation, meaning an action or speech that makes someone annoyed or angry, especially deliberately. So your husband or children or anyone does something, earlier I asked you about rude, they do something rude, but now, say, do they do something or says something, and your first reaction is to be provoked about it, annoyed over it, angry over it. It doesn't even have to be that they did anything rude. They just came in and said, what's for dinner? And you're like, what do you mean, what's for dinner? You just always expect me to make dinner? Is your first reaction to be provoked, annoyed, angry? And if that's true, why? Think about yourself. Why am I so easily irritated? Why am I so easily provoked? Now, think, and think about it this way as well. Perhaps God allows much provocation in your life because he wants you to learn not to be so easily irritated. If this is your thing and you're feeling convicted over this right now, you know what's going to happen this afternoon? You're going to have so many irritating things that are going to just be right in front of you. It's just, the, it's just the way it happens because you need training. You need practice. You need examples of that so that you can walk with God and trust him through it. Instead of thinking, well, I'm committing this area of my life to the Lord, and I'm asking him that I won't be so irritated. And then you know what we often expect? Oh, it's going to be easy peasy, and we're not going to have irritating things. Actually, some of the irritations will probably get greater. Some of the provocations will probably get greater. Why? 
because you need practice. I mean, if your child can't seem to get the arithmetic problems, you don't, you don't take the arithmetic problems away. No, you give them more. You give them a little bit harder because they need training. They need more practice. They need to work on it more. So the more provocation in your life, the more opportunity you have and I have to exercise the fruit of the Spirit, to grow in our spiritual maturity. And then every time that we respond correctly and we depend on the Lord to help us through this, you know what? You strengthen that muscle. That muscle, that, that not easily provoked muscle gets a little bit stronger. And then the next time that provocation, another provocation comes, you're like, oh, yeah, I, it's a little bit greater stressor. I'm going to respond correctly. And then God just, God just strengthens your, your irritation muscles, non-irritation muscles, I should say. He strengthens it. And it helps you grow. Do you want that? Do you want practice and patience? Do you want practice in acting becomingly? Do you want practice in not being irritated? Well, God will help you, and he will bring some things along to give you practice, but it's going to be up to you. Are you going to rely on God the Holy Spirit in you, yet not you, but Christ who lives in you, to help you respond the way you ought to respond? Because if you walk by the Spirit, you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. The next is, love does not take into account a wrong suffered. How about you? Do you keep a record of how others have wronged you? God is not saying here that we haven't been wronged. No, we have. We've all been, we've all suffered, and, we, and we've all suffered wrongly. We've suffered because we deserved it, and we've also suffered wrongly, innocently. <clears throat> God is acknowledging this, that we have, because he says love does not take into account a wrong suffered. We've all suffered in this way. We have all been wronged. What God is saying is that love does not record all those wrongs so that we can go back and rehearse them over and over and over. So we can go look at our logbook and say, oh, yeah, on the date of this, this person wronged me. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. That was like, you know, I forgot how, how badly they mistreated me. That's keeping a record. God says we don't do that. We don't rehearse that. We've already talked about what bitterness does to us. So do you rehearse over and over and over in your mind how someone has wronged you? And then they did this, and then, then they did that, and then they did this, and then they, they did that. I mean, think about it. Aren't you glad God doesn't do that with your sins? I mean, God moves them as far as the east is from the west when we come to him. But there are people who love to keep records of how they've been sinned against. We're often the kind of people who remember what we need to forget and forget what we need to remember. So if we want to keep a logbook, let's keep a logbook of how we've been treated good, how we've been treated well, the blessings that God has given to us. You know, that him. Count your, count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. You'll be surprised at all the things. Oh, yeah, then God did this, and he did this, and he used that person to do that. I mean, sometimes I think about... people that I probably never even thanked during the times in my life when I've walked through so much grief. But, you know... God and some, sometimes just brings it to my mind. And I don't even know who did it. Because God gives us so much. God remembers our sin no more. That's what the scripture says. Hebrews 8, verse 12. For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. God doesn't keep a record. I mean, there was a record of our wrongs that stood hostile to us, as Colossians teaches us. And it's, you know, but it was nailed to the cross when Jesus died. And he doesn't, and when we, it was nailed there, and when we trust in him, God doesn't remember it anymore. So all those sins, too, that you committed or that you've committed, that you've been cleansed from, it's the evil one that wants you to remember those. It's the evil one that wants you to beat yourself up over those. And it's also the evil one who wants you to remember the wrongs that other people have done against you. 
He wants you to be trapped by those things. Psalm 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. And it's not that God can't remember, but he chooses not to hold it against us. It is finished. And that's his mercy. That's his grace. That's his love. And I told you, um, I think I told you last time how a few years ago I copied 1 Corinthians 13 on a poster board when I was going to keep my grandchildren. And we worked on, I took it to their house and we worked on memorizing it together. And it was our theme for the days I was there. And I had this chart where I wanted them to record ways they saw each other show love. I wanted them to, you know, to see them encourage each other. And at first, I was going to have on that chart, in fact, I did have it on the chart because I had it on the back. Um, I, you know, I was going to have them also uh, record ways they didn't show love. But then at some point as we were memorizing the passage, I was just struck with love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. We're not going to record, we're only going to record the way we show love and the way you see each other show love. And, but I also told them, no, we'll deal with the wrongs as they happen. But we're not going to record them. We're not going to keep a record of them. And God taught me a lot that week through my grandchildren as we learned his word together. And y'all, I don't want to be a miserable old woman only remembering wrongs. Do you? I mean, that's what you'll grow into if that's all you do. Love never makes memories of wrongs. I mean, we all talk about, oh, memories, precious memories, and we think about the memories, and we're making memories. Well, let's don't make memories of wrongs. That's a horrible thing to do. It's not becoming. And, another, and a question here, when you hear of someone's wrongdoing, what do you think? How do you feel? And your answer will, pro will probably differ depending on the person guilty of the wrongdoing. If you think of someone you don't like, then, and you hear, hear about his or her wrongdoing, hmm, how do you think about that? But love refuses to take joy or satisfaction or pleasure from anyone's wrongdoing because a true believer loves Christ. The true believer has the heart of Christ. So it doesn't matter our personal and especially our sinful feelings about the one doing the wrong. So the question again becomes, do I really love Christ? There are no limits to Christ's love. 1 Peter 4, 8 says, Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. And the, the uh, context of this verse says this, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. And then Proverbs ten twelve, and we're going to end here. I'll say a few things before I end. Proverbs 10, verse 12 says, Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. And I'd hope to get a little bit further today than I actually did. But we'll come back next time because we, we, there's a lot more to say about this particular part of 1 Corinthians 13, that love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. There's much more that God wants to teach us through it. So let me close in prayer. Father, I thank you for our time today. I thank you for the kind attention of the women and girls in this room. And I thank you again for the women who are live streaming and who will be watching this later. Father, please use this passage in our lives. Father, please help us to be women who will take a good hard look at ourselves and our own hearts. And that we would be women who would love you most of all. That we would love you with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind, and with all our strength. Because when we do that, then we will love our neighbor as ourself. We will bring ourselves under the truth of your word. We will lay aside all clamor and malice and, and slander and anger and wrath. And we will be kind to one another. We will be tenderhearted, forgiving each other. Why? Because you have forgiven us in Christ Jesus. And Father, I pray for a woman who might be listening to this who's, who has never understood your grace 
who does not understand that her works will never save her, that all of her good deeds will never make up for the sin that she has committed against you. Father, show her that it's only through Christ's death, burial, and resurrection that she can come to know you and that she can even have the ability to live this kind of life because it's not about us living this way. It's about you living this way through us. Father, thank you for your Holy Spirit who guides us into all truth, who is our helper, who sounds the alarm when we get off track, who woos to us and calls us to obey you. Help us to walk by the Spirit that we, will, that we would not carry out the desires of our flesh. And it's in the holy name of Jesus Christ I pray. Amen. Well, it's door prize time. And if it's your phone, you're not getting